virtual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, future of television, future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do 1,000 gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take 1,000 terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. 1,000 petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The Cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it, this demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What theCUBE does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with theCUBE, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game.
Okay, we're back live in San Francisco, California, here talking about the Node Summit, which is the inaugural event for Node.js and the community for developers, um, powered by Joint, which uh, acquired the inventor of Node.js, uh, Ryan Dahl, who, in just in the past few short years, has really uh, empowered Joint to drive massive valuation of their company, but more importantly, power a huge development community. Um, we're going to be talking to all the smart developers, students, entrepreneurs, executives here in San Francisco where this emerging trend is taking over the Web 2.0 performance category, in my opinion, and uh, we're going to hear about it. Um, next up will be Steve Herod from uh, VMware. Okay, the little echo there on the... On the can't hear myself. Okay, here we go. Steve Herod from VMware is going to come on. Steve's a CUBE alumni. I've been on many times uh, at VMworld and all the events. CTO of VMware. We just heard from the CTO of the Apps Group uh, talking about Cloud Foundry, the inventor of Cloud Foundry. And, uh, you know, VMware is one of those companies, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, probably along with YouTube, as probably the lowest uh, cost acquisition, most value it's produced. YouTube was bought by Google for $1.5 billion, has become a great story for Google. VMware was bought by EMC for $500 million and totally undervalued and is powering earnings for EMC, rocket earnings. VMware is the new platform for IT. And uh, with, under Paul Moritz's leadership, uh, VMware has uh, absolutely taken the uh, industry by storm. And obviously they have competitors with like Amazon and Joyent now. So it would be interesting to hear what, uh, what Steve has to say. And uh, other news out there that we broke today that Mark Lewis, the head of EMC Ventures, steps down as the head of strategy for EMC and uh, head of uh, venture capital for EMC. He's going to be pursuing other interests. Um, other news, Mark Hopkins, we're going to try to get Dave Vellante in from Boston via Skype and try to get that uh, cut, cut in here and get his perspective on what he thinks of the EMC announcements. Uh, but really the big story here is Node.js. Uh, it's a geek fest uh, here. All the alpha geeks in San Francisco, a lot of emerging companies from New York, all over the world coming to San Francisco to talk about Node.js. Really a framework built on, on, on top of JavaScript, a set of libraries that allows developers to become super developers. You take a front-end developer who knows JavaScript, you give them Node.js and they have instant back-end skills managing the hard stuff like networks, threads, and so on, mostly reserved for C, C++ programmers. So Node.js represents a fundamental shift in the developer community, fundamental shift in onboarding new developers, new front-end developers, giving them some expertise in the back-end with cloud, and that the result of all that is more product, more applications, and better value. Uh, and I'd like to get Steve Harris' perspective on this when he comes on, uh, what it means for the technical community, uh, especially with developers. Because VMware owns Spring Source, and that was an ecosystem of developers around Java. So it'd be interesting take to get uh, the VMware perspective around Java versus Node.js, given the Spring Source acquisition. Um, so Steve is a good guy. When he's ready, we'll come in. Uh, his, uh, Mark Lewis, moving on to new, new, bigger, better things. Uh, is uh, Steve ready? Are you ready? Okay. That speaker, a little bit of echo on the speaker back there. Okay. Hey, how are you? Good to see you again. Looking good. Got the good, good color shirt on. Got the green for Node Summit. He was color coded. Here, sit right here. I brought a toy to show you. All right. Welcome back to the Cube. This is a twelfth time, uh, zillionth time on the Cube. Welcome, welcome back. Yeah, thanks. How, How you good? been? Good. Doing great. We uh, we're here getting into the developer ecosystem here with Node Summit, and uh, you know, kind of people are like, what's going on with Node? Um, I talked to some of my friends, kind of in the valley, um, not necessarily technical geeks. They're like, what's Node? Mm -hmm. um, so you have something, a phenomenon here, just in you know three short years. Yep. Um, Node.js has come out of the woodwork. You know, obviously powered by cloud and joint, for example, just exploding with performance improvements for developers, kind of turning that front end developer into more of a computer scientist back end related mm -hmm. C threading, some complex stuff that, you know, most hardcore dudes would go for, back end guys <laughs> right, as they right. call it. Um, what's your take on it? Well, it's exciting to be here. Obviously, it's it's taking off very rapidly because it has some nice scalability properties, um, a really good way to do multi-threading. Um, and it's I think we talked about this about a year and a half ago. It's really, to me, part of this broader story of just a, almost a renaissance in the way people are writing applications. It's a world where there's new uh, new languages, new services, and, and developers can be more productive than ever. You know, An individual developer can do things you would have never dreamed of an individual doing in the past. 
we had Derek on from Cloud Foundry. Obviously, Cloud Foundry was the conversation at VMworld, mm -hmm. dominated the Twitter stream and the, the you know, Clouderati and a lot of the elite tech guys arguing land grab for VMware. Obviously, Paul laid out his vision in 2010 at VMworld um, about the frameworks, and Spring Source was a big story at, during that VMworld. Right. Uh, what's changed within VMworld, if anything, or are you guys still on course? Obviously, Spring Source, Java-based community, you got JavaScript. What's, what's going on? How does this relate to that, or vice versa? Yeah, at the very top level, our, our overall theory is that this notion of cloud computing is changing absolutely everything, and we certainly see it, and we're best known for changing the way data centers are built and run, but it's also changing the way applications are written, and it's changing the way actually all of us consume them with new devices. So the context for VMware is that we really want to help enterprises get from where they are today to, to the promise that comes from these new frameworks and everything else. So Derek, you probably heard this morning, talked about uh, Cloud Foundry, which is our, we call it our open platform as a service, and uh, it's, it's really taking off quite quickly. We only launched it in April of last year, and if, if you track both developers and, more importantly right now, the community, uh, it's really getting a lot of traction as people see this as a, a great way to write applications. How about the big conversation around path to profitability, commercialization? You know, developers, not, they don't really sell out per se, but they also have the mind that they want to have a partner mm -hmm. that could take them across that bridge to success, meaning distribution of their product, um, what's, what are you seeing in the developer community around that? Obviously they want to have, they don't want to just build something and say, ah, it's only on Microsoft, it's only on this. Right. What's, what's, what's your take on that? Well, so we, we certainly aim to, uh, we are an enterprise company for sure. We, we focus on businesses and helping them consume the new technologies that are very commonplace for uh, consumers and in the web properties. So uh, we end up having a really nice relationship. Our whole goal is to take very innovative technologies like Node and really help accelerate their use in the enterprise by bringing Maybe it's, uh, it's levels of uh, security or even knowledge of things like compliance and, and things that are kind of boring uh, but very important to companies. And so that's why we end up having a really good relationship with the, with the newer frameworks coming along. I really do think we can accelerate their adoption in a, in a more conservative environment. What does Paul Moritz think about all this? I mean, he's, he's us hands in, in the cookie jar when it comes to geeking out on the architecture. Obviously, Node is a threat, is an opportunity. Obviously, you guys are embracing it uh, yeah. in, in Cloud Foundry. What's the vision on this in, in, in terms of disruption in future scenarios? Yeah, Paul's a great guy. I, I don't know if you ever had him interview. We're trying him. to get him on the cube. I just talked to <laughs> Brian Cox. He's going to try to send him an email, but oh, good. Paul, we're ready for you. You. No, we'll, Paul loves, we'll treat actually, you well. Paul showed me his Ruby program he wrote the other day. I couldn't believe our CEO was doing that. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, he, has a, he has a really good perspective on this. Obviously, from his time at Microsoft, he knows that it's really applications that drive a platform. And uh, in the same way, we are seeing this, this new world of having uh, new applications. You know, we obviously would like them to end up on VMware uh, virtualization systems and VMware-based clouds. But to, to succeed, the most important thing is that the developers like it. So his strategy and our strategy as a whole is very clearly, let's first of all make sure we're doing the best thing for developers, and then over time we will make sure that we are the best place to run it, or at least one of the best places, and, and that'll be how we pull together um, our own strategy for, um, for where we do want to make money in this space, but really it has to start with making sure the best way to write applications is on Cloud Foundry. How about the Spring Source? Any update there? What's their impact to this community? Obviously Java, JavaScript. There's been some debates around what Node.js could do versus mm -hmm. other com com competing up approaches like, yeah. like what Java can do. Well, I think one thing that, uh, that a number of people here have talked about and we certainly believe are that real big applications headed forward are not, you know, they're, they're polyglot, I think is the phrase everyone's using right now. That they're not te uh, just one system that's a monolithic app. They tend to be a number of services pulled together. And, and some of those will be written in Java, some might be written in Node. And I think that's really where things are headed. So we, we don't see them in any way competitive. In fact, um, you know, the Spring Group is really focusing on how can it reach out and interact with other languages and services. And both, uh, both Node and Spring and many other frameworks right now are looking at the best way to consume Redis or MongoDB or a lot of the new application services that are coming together. So we're really, we're focused on making Spring the best way to do Java. We're focused on making Cloud Foundry the best place for Spring as well as for Node. Um, Node.js is early, so it's an emerging, you know, young, infant language, but it's getting massive traction as we talked about. What things do you see that, that you, you would do to add to the to success of Node in terms of what does it need to work on? Like a, you know, like a toddler growing up, it's you know, still not found its legs yet truly in my opinion, and uh, obviously we're seeing commercial deployments, LinkedIn's using it for some of their mobile apps, and we're hearing about some other success stories mm -hmm. that Joyant's parading around, but well, you know, from, from your perspective, from VMware, say, okay, this is a good trend, mm -hmm. developers like it, hackers are hacking on it, 
it's good with the cloud. Great, right. got that. What's what does it need to work on? If you could, if you could put the Steve Harrod, you know, poking the fire there, what would you add to Node? Well, I think it's on a great trajectory, and it's it's a slightly different way of thinking of how you write a program. And multi-threading is what makes it scalable from the start. You know, I think it's it is so early that a lot of what you're going to see work on is how do you make it embrace other other languages and other services that are out there and make them extremely consumable. And I think that's what every language goes through as it starts to move forward. I think uh, there's a very rich community, obviously, much more uh, active community than you'd expect for something at this level. So I think the community yeah. itself is going to decide what's most important and making sure it stays open and that a lot of people can contribute will be well, how it gets there. What's your opinion about the entrepreneur's opportunity out there? Obviously, I talked to a lot of the Node Jam companies last night when um, at the uh, meetup over there, and and there's two types of startup categories that I'm seeing. The Me Too collaborative social app. I'm going to do something that looks like everything else with chat and blah, blah, blah. And then kind of real programming going on around white spaces around solutions in the IT world because the IT world is broad. Mm -hmm. What's different from the consumer side is that you know one hit one, there's only one Twitter, there's only one Facebook, mm -hmm. so you put everything in and those guys invest there. IT's got a lot of white space, so right. what do you see um, to kind of uh, share with those entrepreneurs out there that are good white spaces that Node is perfect for? No. Uh, well, I think you can't go to any enterprise right now who is not worried, for instance, about how applications can become mobile. So I, I go to many companies that have that existing application that works only in the browser or maybe it even has a, an old Windows type of framework around it. But I do think there's a huge niche for the development tools that can help companies either make existing applications mobile friendly or go directly and create those new mobile applications themselves. So that's a clear one. I think the other one is, uh, is obviously looking at companies that have a lot more of their systems coming together in one place. So the notion of a easy way to achieve scale is also something that would come in. So the white space is certainly the tools and the language itself, but I think also uh, the, the consulting and really getting out there and helping companies understand how to use it the best. So I was talking with our team um, a couple of weeks ago and we're talking about you know, Silicon Academy, a site we're trying to get off the ground, uh, looking for funding, so anyone uh, <laughs> who wants to donate, uh, uh, give us some cash. Um, but really it's about this, this void of, of skill set. And you know, it, if you're a developer and you know CSS and you know back end, mm -hmm. you're a rock star. You're not going to be unemployed for less than a New York minute. <laughs> um, so what, what, we're, what we were discussing is around Node.js is that this opens up a range of headroom for a developer who is a design guy or front end guy who knows JavaScript to lower the abstractions within Node mm -hmm. to do the minimum they need to do mm -hmm. with networking and, and, and so on in the plumbing. Um, so we see that breadth of opportunity. Do you agree? Do you see that the same way? Do you see this being a, a path for being more back endish? Well, as you said, obviously the, the job market as a whole is in very good shape for, for the technically strong people. And if this does enable people who are strong designers and strong, um, strongly available at JavaScript to think even more about scalable applications and, and maybe even the mobile aspect of it, then certainly their own job prospects will, will grow. So I think that's a very interesting angle to take So the on cloud it. will provide more back-end and uh, simplicity. I think so. Um, so obviously, that back-end guys are C++, C guys. You know, when I went to school, that's what we learned, and there was nothing really else, and you had to know threading, you had to deal with you know, right. um, CPU-bound issues, you have block-based, uh, thing. So can you deconstruct this whole notion of event-based uh, programming and non-blocking around Node.js and, and what's it, you know, some can say, oh, it doesn't, it's only non-blocking. That's bad, or is it bad? So um, what do you, what's your take on how do you weigh in on that blocking versus non-blocking? <laughs> well, I haven't, I haven't been doing uh, too much in that front for a little while, but, but obviously there is a, a, a notion that you learn and, and a lot of the engineers at VMware are very much low level programmers and we deal with threading and, and core operating system principles all the time. And that takes a very specific type of person and, and it's, you know, it's something that is very critical to the programs working. But you can't expect people to understand um, you know, locking and, and threading at the level most operating system people do. So I do think the most important thing about Node is how easy it's made for concurrency to happen to someone who hasn't had to go through and learn all the things about mutexes and, and yeah, race yeah. conditions and stuff that you probably don't want to know about. Yeah, in, in a high end CS degree, basically. Right. So you have people who are hackers, um, younger generation, who are doing a lot of Rails front end. Mm -hmm. um, so that question I asked the joint guy is, uh, I got a question on Twitter that said, what do I, if, I, if I'm a young gun learning programming, do I start with Node.js or Rails? <laughs> What's your advice? I, I don't have a strong <laughs> strong advice on either. I think the most important thing is to pick a project that is interesting to you 
And I, yeah. I do think, again, the, the notion of polyglot systems is what you're going to see. So I think there are places for a lot of different languages. And I personally uh, suggest people have a bit of breadth early on so they at least know what people are talking about when they have the trade-offs. So um, just kind of find a couple questions. I know you've got to roll and do a presentation, but uh, you know, the, you, we mentioned operating systems. That's been something. One of the tweets earlier was the word abstraction mm -hmm. are being kicked around. And you know, people in that business know what that means, right? And I think Paul Moritz said, uh, you know, he talked about it in 2010 when he laid out the architecture of that hardened top concept. Mm -hmm. um, what is the future of the operating system in, in with cloud? Because in cloud, that's not just the cloud, you've got data centers now impacted. So, you know, we've been riffing on this concept of the modern operating system right. in the data center, whereas everything's decoupled. Also, you guys have that kind of framework. What's your view on, where are we? Bottom of the second <laughs> right. inning? I mean, what, what's that's happening? That's great, I think we're in the fourth inning, roughly. <laughs> I think it's, um, this is one of my favorite topics. I was an operating systems person all my life. Um, and the traditional role of an operating system has been to manage hardware and make it abstracted, and then to provide APIs and, and services for applications. And what's so interesting right now is that virtualization is now on, you know, it's running more than half of all applications. And so the notion of applications talking to hardware through the OS is gone. And then things like Node and, and Ruby and other frameworks have really abstracted out the operating system system calls. So in, since it's getting squished on both sides, and it means that the role has to change, so I think that's where there's a huge opportunity and we've already seen a lot of these changes. I think the reason that things like Node have taken off is that machines are also powerful enough to really be able to handle a lot of the abstractions that operating systems used to have to be you know, very efficient at doing. So pull them all together and I think the, the role of the operating system is changing dramatically. Uh, when you talk to people here, they don't necessarily know or even care what version of Linux yeah, yeah. they're running. It's really an interesting time. The web and the net is an operating environment. Certainly the data center is an environment and it needs an operating system, hence the change. Uh, so I guess the next question is, um, the emergence of infrastructure as a service leads to platform as a service. SaaS has been out there for a while, uh, software as a service. Um, all that's kind of you know, uh, coming together. If I'm an entrepreneur and I'm going to want to build a big sustainable company, you know, I don't want to build a tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to build a platform. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first instinct with entrepreneurs, I want to build a platform. But there are platform wars going on. And so it's the platform as a service market, it really is a race to zero, as I wrote in one of my blog posts, where it's so competitive that the, there's not a lot of value there. It's almost like web hosting, right? Mm -hmm. Where, okay, you're hosting the site and you want to get in the business of hosting with Rackspace and Amazon? Uh, I don't think so if I'm an entrepreneur. It's not that exciting. The exciting is the, is the applications, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going on at the middle layer, okay? Because if platform as a service is becoming somewhat commoditized and you say it's shrinking on both sides, um, that middleware model is evolving very rapidly. What does an entrepreneur do to get that same benefit of, of a platform? Right. Because you don't, they don't want to build a tool but if a tool has platform features that creates nestedness and lock-in or you know, sustainability. So take me through the mindset of, of how you guys look at that, because I know you guys think about that with your architecture. We do, and uh, that's a deep question on a number of fronts. The, uh, you know, first of all, it's an operating system, I think, that's getting squished on both sides. I think platform from an application level is, is very much in a nascent state, and, and I do that's, think that's because of the rise of multiple frameworks. But to me, the most important part is you can write your application, but how it, it reaches out to the outside world, whether it's to do a tweet, whether it's to access data in an interesting way, or whether it's to leverage a, a great new service from a telco provider. I think the most interesting part right now is how to really get those interfaces right so that you can take an application and you can write the core logic and you can allow a community to build around it, but it has this notion of scale and this notion of capability that an individual couldn't write on their own. So again, I think that's what you're seeing from a lot of the folks here is, you know, how do we bring together new data types, new messaging in, in a social community around an application or an overall application framework? And the notion of getting to a platform is something a lot of people talk about. It's extremely hard and it always starts by creating something of value and then having easy ways for other people to enhance the value with their own capabilities. And that's where I think these services come in directly. So the value creation for the entrepreneur is get the app out there, interfaces. So your advice would be, let's make the interfaces really good mm -hmm. and then you're not a tool. That's right, I mean, the, the course, the <laughs> tool core in notion the sense of, of a, not as not a, use a bad person, term, yeah. but like, you know, like a, a, an application tool. Yeah, I think you platform. should be an enabler for, for more people to add value. That really is the definition of a platform. Okay, so what's going on in VMworld these days? So to share us with the, you know, what's happening, we've got VMworld coming up next year, we'll have the cube there again. Sure. Um, what's happening internally, Asli? 
things are growing, great earnings, EMC no, really record exciting. earnings uh, as well. Yesterday we announced our, our first billion dollar quarter, which I've been there for a long time, thinking of a billion dollars in software sales. It's a pretty pretty exciting. Um, but the, the more important thing going on is this whole, this whole movement of this ecosystem with us. Um, I'm excited about on uh, February 13th, we have our partner exchange which is uh, about 4,000 of our partners coming together in Las Vegas to really talk about what we do together. And back to your point on platform, that is what it's it's all about in that sense. Yeah, when I hear some uh, some, some announcements coming around that, I uh, Parag sent me an email saying there's a big announcement coming, so uh, we'll be we'll be watching it. I kind of know what it is. I don't want to spill the beans on it. I told <laughs> him I wouldn't yes. wouldn't blog it. Steve Herod, Cube alumni, thanks so much for coming back in and getting the hook from the PR handlers. Uh, <laughs> Great job for getting you in here. Appreciate it. All right, Always thanks, a pleasure. Good to see you Talking again. shop. Steve Harrod, CTO of VMware, Cube alum. Always get him. Great perspective. Go and do the keynote now. And we'll be right back with a short clip. And uh, we'll come right back with more programming from Node Summit in San Francisco. First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. Well, I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the cube now. Right. You know, at first the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the cube. <laughs> hey, I'm about to go on the cube. You never know what's gonna happen. I'm. Uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. I uh, hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to uh, to communicate with a broad audience. A lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience, it's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time, it's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. So for CUBE to be here at a conference like this, that's got 15, 20,000 people, and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful media, wonderful media. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format, and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to settle for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit him up on the HP question. A lot's changed at HP, some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to the, the, the real facts, compare you to the choices our users have, and have you respond to it on the spot, right? Thinking real time, and so that's real talk, not just a, kind of a paper interview, I think. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com, and I'm here with Dave Vellante. We are inside theCUBE. The Cube is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, extract all the signal from the noise, and share that with you. And great guest lineups. We've got CEOs, CTOs, with all the top executives, bloggers, thought leaders, venture capitalists. I'm absolutely stunned by, because I know it demands 100% attention for these guys to be up there talking to people about a wide variety of technology topics. I can't believe these guys can make it so many days in a row. So I'm wondering how long they're going to go home and pass out for after this. But it was incredible, they, they just do a fantastic job. If you're not having a conversation, 
then you're very scripted. And if you're scripted, then you might be getting the right words, but you're often not getting the whole meaning and the whole depth of the conversation to the fullest extent. I think this is a heck of a lot more authentic. It comes straight from the heart and the brain. Sometimes you might forget to make some of your points if you're not a real-time thinker. But I think from both from a participation and from a consuming point of view, it's much more real. Chris holds no punches. So I've been on a cube uh, a number of times, and I think the, the interesting thing about, the, the, about being in that particular venue in that format, they introduced me as, hey, I, hey, Hoff doesn't pull punches. Well, they don't either, right? They ask really difficult, uncomfortable questions sometimes. And you can tell people uh, and the positions and where they are uh, in terms of what they're able or, or desirous to speak of, uh, you can tell where they are on that borderline between kind of just, you know, a honestly answering questions versus kind of glossing over them. And I, I enjoy being there because I, I don't want to say I'm outspoken, but I honestly answer questions uh, with, with the full intent of being able to be um, respectful to the people that I, I bring solutions to, right? If I whitewash this crap, you're gonna turn me off every single time you see me on, on, on any venue, let alone, let alone the Cube. So I, I like being asked tough questions, I like answering them honestly, and that's a fantastic venue for doing it. Otherwise you get on panels and you got a bunch of talking heads blabbing at each other and it's worthless. Yeah, this was my first time on the Cube and um, I really got a chance to get to know John and Dave and, and they're really amazing guys. I mean, the, the knowledge that they come with, um, the topics that they could talk about, the people that they know, and just bringing it all together in this live broadcasting forum is just fantastic. I mean, I just love it. I'm like, I feel like a groupie or something, you know? <laughs> in, in this environment, you know, the social environment, the real-time environment where we're in, right, people look through the marketing fluff very quickly. And if it's not authentic, right, you know, they don't trust it anymore. So in this environment, I think it's a growing trend. Yeah. signifies as a wrap. Okay, we're back in San Francisco, California, where the action is happening here at the Node Summit, Node.js, a phenomenon that's been taking off uh, in the developer community and hacker community. Um, it's totally leveling the playing field for developers to come into the market, not only just build products like they're used to doing it on Amazon, but actually having some scale. And uh, one of the main companies driving this, uh, the company that's driving it, uh, is Joyent, and they, uh, essentially a hire acquired or a hired Brian Dahl, uh, the Node author, and he now works for Joyent, and they're supporting this mission. And I'm here with uh, David Young, the CEO of Joyent, co-founder. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, happy to be here. Great, great to have you on theCUBE, and you know, we want to share the knowledge here. theCUBE is our flagship telecast where we you know, broadcast with the world, share information from the top tech events and the thought leaders, executives, and entrepreneurs. And, um, I want to first congratulate you on your massive financing. Joyant just raised $85 million. Well, thank you. It was, um, you know, really the congratulations goes to the team back at Joyant. They did a great job pulling that deal over the finish line, but um, couldn't be more pleased. You know, when you see, when you see companies like uh, Amazon, who just set the market up early, um, kind of like the hardware store, I've called it the junkyard for developers where they come in and find their parts and build a car, um, really good low cost. Um, the need for a scalable platform in the cloud has been, been key. Um, and as a, as a startup entrepreneur, there's always these fly-by-nights companies that come along. You guys have been around for a long time, built a good business, but all of a sudden have this capability with the cloud and enters the mobile world enters in the application surge. How has that affected your business? And, and go back in time and, and can you point to an inflection point and say, wow, we are under this massive mega trend and, and positioned perfectly for it. When was that time? Well, I think you, you're characterizing Amazon very well. I mean, it is a junkyard in the sense that it's, it, its mission, as far as I understand it, was always to sort of allow people to put together low cost solutions. And when we launched our cloud in 2005, we originally built our cloud for our own business. Um, and we recognized that we needed something which at the time we didn't call cloud, we called it on-demand compute. 
And um, we built something that was very efficient. We had not raised any venture capital. So all the money was coming out of our pockets. It had to be very efficient. It had to work. It had to be very high quality. So Jason Hoffman and I sort of built this initial version. And we continued to play with it, honestly, until um, in 2009, uh, we met up with the folks at Intel, sort of shared our vision, and they said, "This is we really see this as being something that can scale not only from sort of small mom and pop projects, but up to you know one of the topics that is being talked about here at the Node Summit this week is is the Internet of Things, and it's absolutely critical that you have an infrastructure platform that can scale from you know a two-person development shop up to millions and millions, up to trillions and billions of things talking to each other over a cloud." I think that's really the inflection point, people understanding that it was more than just delivering on-demand compute, but delivering high-quality networking, high-quality storage, all of that in a single, simple, easy-to-use package, and that's, that's really what Joint represents. You know, I was, I'm on record as saying that you know, Web 2.0 was um, very hyped up, um, and I love hype as much as anyone else because I'm an entrepreneur, but you know, Web 2.0 kind of had that same Web 1.0.com bubble pop, but really what we're seeing now with what you guys are part of with Node is really Web 2.0 because the browser was the web and now all of a sudden instantly we're living in a connected society as you mentioned, Internet of Things and, and right now there's smartphones, soon to be toasters and other things. As we, but here you have a massive surge of connectedness right. and you have an application market that's exploding with Apple, for example, and Android. Um, you know, what have you learned, I mean, in terms of this? Because now you have to deal with massive rollouts. And, you know, as an example, some company has to have a mobile application for their sales force. That could be 30,000 sales reps or, you know, hundreds and hundreds that are not used to that. So this is going to change the execution plans within IT and within businesses. So what is the key to all this? Well, the key is, is having an engineering team like we have at Joint, and part of the proof of the high quality of the engineering is what we've been able to do with Node. But having a team that is innovating from bare metal all the way out to the client. And, you know, it's a commentary, a sad commentary, I think, when you look at Silicon Valley and you see that very few companies these days are actually innovating at the operating system level. We actually have our own operating system at Joint called SmartOS, and it's freely available at smartos.org. Anyone can download it and use it. But we've really built, beginning with the operating system, an operating system that is purpose-built for multi-tenancy and for the Internet of Things. And so having that sort of technology set that, and you have to, you, know, you, you mentioned it, Joint's not an overnight success. We started in 2004, we continued to iterate, we sort of tinkered around trying to figure out what is the right technology stack for people, and I think we're now coming out, if you will, with this big fundraise as Telefonica and some of our other investors sort of validate the technology stack that we've been de developing over the past few years. I think it totally validates what you guys have. Great product, we're big fans of you guys. Right place at the right time, obviously with a great product, better mousetrap and more. Uh, obviously Steve Harrod was talking about the OS's. We have uh, Dave Vellante, my co-host, who's usually here at the table with me. So uh, what David doesn't understand is that David Vellante is usually sitting with me. And he's our, our analyst with SiliconANGLE Network. He runs wikibon.org. Uh, Dave Vellante, you can see him in the, in the little, little monitor there. Say hi to David Young. Dave, if you can hey, see Dave. us. Uh, he's the CEO of Joyent. Dave and Dave's team, uh, da our research team headed up by Dave is working on this IT infrastructure, I mean, I'm sorry, IO infrastructure manifesto that we're putting together. So Dave, why don't you, to, why don't you chime in and see if you have any questions for, uh, for uh, David Young. Hi David, how you doing? It's great to uh, talk to you. Congratulations. Can we hear him? Uh, can you guys hear me? Crank it. All right, we Hi guys, can you hear me? No. We're having ten. John, can you hear me now? <laughs> We're always trying something new. Mark, can you can you guys hear me? All right, Dave. Thanks so much. We wish we could hear you, but uh, All right, well, we can't. So All right, you're out. That. Oh, so so Dave, back to uh, Joyant. Um, Mark, the speaker. I can. Do all right, so take me through the operating system thing, because obviously you guys have lived the grid days. I know yeah, that. That was a big part right. of the uh, early days of cloud. Before it was called cloud. You know, you get grid, smart grid, and all those initiatives. Essentially creating what grid should be, which is cloud, right? So take me through some of the clients you guys have, and the question I got on Twitter was, what's the biggest name that's running Node that you know of? 
uh, company that's notable? Well, the companies that we could talk about, um, LinkedIn, their mobile um, app is a Node app. Um, we have companies like Voxer. Voxer turns your Android or iPhone into a push-to-talk device, a walkie-talkie, and that's really cool stuff. Um, and then obviously we're really proud of the work we've been doing with Microsoft to make sure that Node runs on Windows and, and Azure. And I actually just got a briefing on some of the things that are being done on those platforms. Um, so the, the adoption has been swift. I've never in the 20 plus years I've been in this industry see people adopt technology like they're adopting Node. Um, but then we're also very happy with what we've done with Node on SmartOS because only on joint SmartOS is Node fully introspective. And what this means is that you can see what Node's doing in production in real time. And I think that as people scale their apps out to Internet of Things type applications, this full introspection will become more and more important. What's Microsoft doing with Node? I mean, obviously they're here, big sponsor of the event. Google's not here at all. Yes. Um, but we, I'm hearing some really good things about what Microsoft's working on and uh, been aggressive with Node. Can you share with us anything there? Absolutely, and it's all public, but um, um, Microsoft has Node running on Windows and, and the Azure platform. So any Node application that you write on, say, Mac OS X or Linux or SmartOS will run on the Azure platform out of the box. So. That's, that really just allows us all to talk to more developers, and I think more developers is a good thing. So I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, like you guys are, and there's a lot of other entrepreneurs out at Node Jam. We saw them last night. We were talking to a bunch of them. Um, exciting crowd. They're optimistic. You know, but they've got to make an investment, and what's great about what you're doing is you're providing an environment where lower costs to get into the game. Students are building startups. We saw a couple last night. Um, but they care about a couple things, obviously the community side of it, which is cool right now, but really the distribution of their app and making money. So as the business head of Joyent, what's your plans for the money-making side for developers, the ecosystem? What things are you guys doing to help me uh, make some cash? I mean, is it the distribution? Is there, is there any kind of uh, programs you guys are running for entrepreneurs? Well, I think you're seeing the first part of it, and we, we're not going to talk about that publicly today, but certainly as we build out what we're calling our cloud alliance with, and the first alliance partner is Telefonica Digital, um, we're going to be providing a lot of monetization opportunities for people on a global basis. And when I say global, I don't just mean territorially, meaning in Spain or in Europe or in Asia or in North America, but also being able to address different market segments. So. Our gaming companies are going to be able to get into different markets and address different gaming segments. Um, we're going to have um, ability to address enterprise class markets, small, medium business markets. Um, and, and that's really stuff that we're just beginning to work on this year, but I'm very excited about the prospects. As you say, if, if our developer customers aren't making money, then we're not able to sell them. St there was a quote I heard talking about Amazon versus Joyent, and the quote was, um, we never got screwed by Joyent. What does that mean to you as a CEO? Well, um, Amazon, Amazon. That's good. I mean, obviously, no, that's great customer satisfaction. Um, well, look, I mean, at Joint, um, our corporate hero is Southwest Airlines. And, and literally, Jason and I have gone and had our picture taken in front of the Southwest Airlines um, CEO's car. And, you know, we love that company because it's all about efficiency, it's all about putting the customer first. Um, and we, we try to have the same DNA at Joint. Uh, whereas Amazon, look, I mean, Amazon is Walmart with all the charm boiled out of it. Um, it's just sort of not about the customer. It's about, you know, making, making the nickel, making the dime. So I looked at uh, Amazon, and a lot of entrepreneurs talk about this, is that, you know, these new environments where it's a lot of I.O. intensive, they're very expensive. Um, there's really not a price value with Amazon in, in most instances. Storage looks good, I like storage, it's okay. Uh, but when you get into compute cycles, it's expensive. So you're doing anything with real time. Amazon, you get a tax on that. Um, obviously that's not good for Amazon, I'm sure they might fix it. But that speaks to the value proposition of what people want right now. And how do you see some of the changes around the cloud? Because um, we heard Steve Herod up here, big operating system guy talking about OS's. Um, and you guys are essentially an OS in the cloud and providing these simplicity environments, make it easy to use. Um, what needs to get done? I mean, Node obviously is, is, a, is a toddler, just getting, its, getting on the feet, walking, walking fast. Um, it stumbles a little bit here and there, and blocking, non-blocking, people are arguing if it's legit or not. Um, what's next? What needs to be worked on? What are the white spaces around Node that, that takes it to the next level? 
Well, uh, so I, I want to be clear. I, you know, I really admire what Amazon's done in evangelizing sort of outsourced IT. I think they've done a fantastic job. And at Joint, we, we admire in particular S3. S3's been a fantastic service for people. Um, I just was heard from Microsoft that they actually offer an S3-like service. I didn't know that. So I'm, I'm anxious to go home and back to the office and, and try it out and give it, you know, throw it through its paces. I think you're going to continue to see whether it's at the compute level, the storage level, the networking level, a lot of innovation, um, whether it comes from Joint or Microsoft or Amazon. Um, but here's what's true is the way that people think about the data center, that's all being turned upside down. So it's a very exciting time to be innovating and filling in those gaps. Um, you know, Node is one thing that we've contributed to the community. Um, we have more that we're going to be doing in 2012. Um, and, and I you know, look forward to seeing how people react to some of, the, some of our initiatives. David Young, the CEO of Joyent, co-founder, great company, great success story. This is uh, one of those entrepreneurial successes where you have guys with a great vision, just get into business, make ends meet, put their own money in, uh, build it up, create a great product, get it in the market, and all of a sudden the market explodes and they're drafting up with it, great innovation. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate it, thank okay. you. David Young, the CEO of uh, Joyant, you can step out. We're going to go and bring in, see if we can't bring in Dave Vellante again. Uh, we had technical difficulties. I didn't want Dave to interrupt David Young, so I wanted to finish that interview. Great guy, great success. $85 million in fresh cash. That's going to be some great uh, movement with Joyant. Expect hiring, expect some big marketing plans. Um, and hopefully they'll sponsor our DevOps Angle site, uh, which will shake them down for some cash later. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll get him. Dave, can I, are you there? I am, can you hear me? I can. Hey, how you doing, man? That was hey, a great we, interview. We miss I, you, uh, Dave. You know, my take on that is uh, Amazon's SLAs, uh, I would summarize as, as this, and I, I would agree with David, I, I love Amazon. They were the, the trendsetter, but their SLAs for the enterprise are, are, are I, I would characterize as follows. We'll do our best, and if we don't, send us an email. And, and that's not adequate for most enterprise customers, and I think that's really where Joint is trying to tuck in. And I think the second point is that I think there are a whole new breed of applications, as you've been talking about all day, and as David Floyer's post today points out, that are emerging with the cloud. Some of the more traditional yeah. block-based database applications, and as well as a lot of the unstructured stuff that you'd associate with archiving. So, uh, very exciting times, and, and congratulations to Joyent for the big raise. Dave, what is your take on um the DevOps IT bridge that's happening. DevOps with public cloud, you're seeing Steve Herod talk about it, David Young from Joyent talking about the IT challenges around mobile and connected devices. Um, I know you and Wikibon, the team of analysts, are working on a new manifesto around IO, an IO infrastructure. Can you share with us uh, your perspective on what it's going to take to move DevOps into mainstream IT? Well, I think that it's, Herod's interview was very interesting, and, and of course, he and Maritz have been talking for quite some time about how the operating system is becoming passe, that you know, increasingly uh, the, the, the platform is becoming the cloud, and, and people like Herod and Maritz and others are, are really facilitating that, and I think we are seeing a fundamental shift in the way that infrastructure is, is, is managed, and the intersection between applications and infrastructure is a very interesting topic. As, as you know, we've been following, you guys at SiliconANGLE have been all over this, and I think it's the next big thing, if you will, and, and I think it's going to completely, it's going to have implications on several things. How infrastructure is managed, uh, uh, everybody talks about efficiency. CIOs want to be more efficient with their infrastructure. Well, well DevOps is really going to drive those levels of efficiency, and you've seen it in these large web giants, you know, the programmable infrastructure, if we will, that intersection between apps and infrastructure, now moving into the enterprise, and I think that this, this, this Node Summit and Node.js trend are really the start of that. And the other thing I, I was really struck by with, with Herod's discussion is the notion that you can't expect developers to worry about, you know, the, the, the mass of developers to worry about low-level operating system commands. We're talking about a much broader base of developers now, and that's going to mean new applications um, emerging. And then I think the third point there is that, and you know, we, we cover a lot of, of storage issues here at Wikibon and infrastructure issues. Storage is changing dramatically. The idea of spinning disk uh, is changing as a primary uh, storage uh, medium. Disk sucks, 
It spins. It's the only mechanical part of a computer infrastructure, as you know, John, and as a former programmer, you would always have to think about, okay, I've got to you know, worry about that spinning disk and that latency, and I can do other things while that's happening. Progr applications are being completely rewritten to take advantage of new infrastructure that's emerging that, as Floyer points out, is IO-centric, meaning that the applications and, and the IOs are coming together in a way that Flash, for example, and, and we talk about companies like Fusion IO, EMC's got Project Lightning coming up, Viridint, SolidFire, Flash-based systems now closer to memory are really going to be what's driving application performance. A whole new set of performance characteristics, data textures, unstructured and structured data coming together, which means an explosion of new application functionality. Alex, we're live. Huh? Oh, Dave, uh, thanks so much. Uh, Dave is Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org, research team for SiliconANGLE Network. Uh, great to see you. Wish you were here. Um, and uh, what did you think of uh, EMC and uh, VMware's earnings? And then also uh, you saw uh, Mark Lewis step down from um, EMC Ventures. What's your take on those two things? Well. Well, EMC and VMware in particular. VMware, uh, its first billion dollar revenue quarter, they announced yesterday. To me, that's a tremendous milestone for a software company. Uh, the, the company's you know, approaching $40 billion in value. Uh, EMC paid $625 million for it. Greatest acquisition in the history of IT. And I have said, I've been on record now for a couple of years saying that uh, EMC slash VMware will be the next $100 billion market value company. Um, so that's one point. The second is EMC continues to crush it. Uh, we saw a little little blip last quarter, you know, which I considered minor. This quarter, EMC right back on track, 18% uh, growth. All all products seem to be gaining share. Uh, uh, Avamar and, and Data Domain exited the quarter uh, at a two billion dollar run rate last quarter, uh, and so the and the company's throwing off tons of free cash flow, records in all the areas, and so. The analysis that I've done on this is if you look at EMC's value, which is now approaching, it probably exceeds $50 billion today. It's a, it, the stock's up for sure on the, on the earnings call. Um, but, but if you look at EMC's value, most of the value, around 60%, is attributable to its ownership of VMware. So the street is dramatically discounting EMC's core business, which is storage. Storage is a great market. It continues to be profitable. It continues to throw off all kinds of cash. And so the street is discounting that. EMC remains a fantastic way, in my opinion, to own VMware. Uh, to your second point about Mark Lewis, John, I saw your post. I was just reading it. I thought it was fantastic. I, th I thought you nailed it. You know, Lewis has been, uh, and I've known Mark for a number of years, uh, a, a real you know, key participant in the uh, transformation of EMC, but I think your last point was right on. It was time for him to go. Uh, it's time for a new breed of management to come in. Uh, uh, Tucci said on the call today that he won't step down in 2012. It'll be actually 2013, but I'm sure that EMC will announce uh, that succession plan in 2012, and they did also say it will be internal. Uh, as we've talked about and as, as Mark Hopkins has written about, that's either going to be David Goulden or Pat Gelsinger. Those are the front runners. Uh, Gelsinger's a technology guy. Uh, Goulden's a, a financial and used to run sales. Uh, Gelsinger would bring EMC, I think, back to its roots of its founding chairman, Dick Egan, who was an engineer. And I think, you know, Goulden is the safe bet for the street. So, uh, you know, we'll have to see. But uh, personally, I'd love to see the, the, the tech guy from California, you know, emerge as the front runner there. Dave, what do you think about the horses on the track right now for um, cl the cloud market, cloud computing and cloud storage? I wrote a post about Joyent's funding. I highlighted Joyent and Nirvonix as two companies that uh, are acquisition targets. Obviously, Joyent setting the valuation of their last round. I'm guesstimating it's over 400 million. Um, Nirvonix, same kind of situation, cloud storage, you got cloud computing, you got cloud storage, um, you, know, you got Amazon, Joyent, VMware. How do you see those horses shaking out on you? Also then you got Microsoft nipping up in there as well. So you know, these yeah, platforms well, of service, what's your take on all this? Yeah, you've named several of them and, and as you were discussing with David Young, I mean the Amazon is obviously the, the darling, the crowd favorite. They come out with new functions so fast and, and they just you know, push it out there. Uh, but they leave a lot of white space, which is fantastic for companies like Joyent, for companies like uh, Nirvonix, another one that you mentioned. These companies in particular are targeting uh, enterprise customers for cloud. Another one is SolidFire. 
uh, which is uh, going to announce later this year. They came out of stealth last year, and they're targeting specifically cloud service providers. These companies bring several things to enterprise CIOs that Amazon doesn't. They give them uh, uh, better SLAs. They stand behind those SLAs. They allow things like audits to be done. Um, uh, they, they help with compliance. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll bundle their high availability SLA services into their monthly fees. Uh, so it's true cloud in that it's pay by the drink. You're eliminating the CapEx and focusing on OpEx just as you are with Amazon, but you're bringing in a level of, of service that is more akin to the enterprise. And Joyent, uh, Nirvonix, uh, uh, other cloud service providers uh, uh, that are emerging, uh, like SoftLayer and VirtuStream, very innovative companies that are bringing new applications to the market. And um, at the heart of this transformation are, are new platform environments like Node.js and new infrastructure architectures, as David Floyer has written about, that are really flash-based systems. And we're going to see in 2012, I predicted this in my uh, predictions post for 2012, a bevy of, of innovation coming from companies like SolidFire. EMC's got Project Lightning that it's going to announce this year. Uh, Fusion IO is absolutely crushing it. You know, we've written about Fusion IO a lot. They're changing the game uh, in the IO stack. Uh, Verident is another company that we're watching, and so a lot of exciting things on the horizon, and uh, really happy uh, to be part of that on theCUBE, John. Thanks for Skyping me in here. Okay, Dave, thanks so much for dialing in. I appreciate your time. I know you're super busy back east. Dave Vellante, co-host of theCUBE in Boston, couldn't make it. Um, great, to, great to see you and hear from you and your perspective. And uh, we'll continue to hold down the fort in this emerging joy and trend. And uh, obviously we love DevOps. We're going to launch DevOps Angle. We've been covering big data. So uh, continue uh, doing your research. Thanks a lot. All right, rock on, thank you. Okay, we're going to be right back. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back, five minutes. Be right back. First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. Well, I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the cube now. Right, and, you know, at first the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the cube. <laughs> hey, I'm about to go on the cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm. Uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. <laughs> I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. It's a great vehicle to uh, to communicate with a broad audience. A lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez. Uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Yeah. When people mention theCUBE, they, they're like, oh my God, I saw you on theCUBE. And they're all excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's an experience, it's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time, it's like they were there. That was like my going to the pleasure. gym. Boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE. So for CUBE to be here at a conference like this that's got 15, 20,000 people and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful medium, wonderful medium. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the oh, rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the question list, right? Okay, next one, next one. They're, they're, it's a conversation, right? And it's, you know, they're going to challenge you. They're not going to settle for the, the marketing hype and the BS and all that that stuff that the industry throws around. Come on, you got to hit him up on the HP question. A lot's changed in HP, some turmoil at the top, obviously, controversy. They're going to hold you down to the, the, the real facts, compare you, 
to the choices our users have and have you respond to it on the spot, right? Thinking real time. And so that's real talk, not just uh, kind of a paper interview, I think. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com and I'm here with Dave Vellante. We are inside theCUBE. The Cube is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events, extract all the signal from the noise and share that with you. And Great guest lineups, we've got CEOs, CTOs, with all the top executives, bloggers, thought leaders, venture capitalists. I'm absolutely stunned by, because I know it demands 100% attention for these guys to be up there talking to people about a wide variety of technology topics. I can't believe these guys can make it so many days in a row. So I'm wondering how long they're going to go home and pass out for after this. But it was incredible, they, they just do a fantastic job. If you're not having a conversation, then you're very scripted. And if you're scripted, then you might be getting the right words, but you're often not getting the whole meaning and the whole depth of the conversation to the fullest extent. I think this is a heck of a lot more authentic. It comes straight from the heart and the brain. Sometimes you might forget to make some of your points if you're not a real-time thinker. But I think from both from a participation and from a consuming point of view, it's much more real. Chris. Holds no punches. So I've been on a cube uh, a number of times, and I think that the interesting thing about the, the, about being in that particular venue in that format, they introduced me as, hey, I, hey, Hoff doesn't pull punches. Well, they don't either, right? They ask really difficult, uncomfortable questions sometimes, and you can tell people uh, and the positions and where they are uh, in terms of what they're able or, or desirous to speak of. Uh, you can tell where they are on that borderline between kind of just you know honestly answering questions versus kind of glossing over them. And I I enjoy being there because I I don't want to say I'm outspoken, but I honestly answer questions uh, with with the full intent of being able to be. Um, respectful to the people that I, I bring solutions to, right? If I whitewash this crap, you're going to turn me off every single time you see me on, on, on any venue, let alone, let alone the Cube. So I, I like being asked tough questions. I like answering them honestly, and that's a fantastic venue for doing it. Otherwise, you get on panels and you got a bunch of talking heads blabbing at each other, and it's worthless. Yeah, this was my first time on the Cube, and um, I really got a chance to get to know John and Dave, and, and they're really amazing guys. I mean, the the knowledge that they come with, um, the topics that they could talk about, the people that they know, and just bringing it all together in this live broadcasting forum is just fantastic. I mean, I just love it. I'm like, I feel like a groupie or something, you know? <laughs> in, in this environment, you know, the social environment, the real-time environment where we're in, right, people look through the marketing fluff very quickly, and if it's not authentic, right, you know, they don't trust it anymore. So in this environment, I think it's a growing trend. Yeah. Hi, Alex Williams here at the Node Summit. We just took a little break. Now we're back with Gianugo Rabellino with Microsoft. How are you doing? Good, 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 good. Thanks for having me. Now you spoke this morning on a panel on cross platforms. What would you say were some of the themes that you heard come out of that discussion? It was interesting to see how the interest of for cross platform is there, how it comes out as a way to future proof your application, how it comes out as a way to provide developer choice, and so on and so forth. And I think that uh, the Node example has been extremely uh, on topic to, to prove that, yeah, it can be done, it should be done, it should be done in the right way. And it was a very, very nice journey. So can you talk about what your, you know, what your thoughts are on, on cross-platform issues related to you know, platform as a service in particular? Of course. So what we are seeing is that uh, the developer world is, is undergoing through you know, many, many abstractions. We, 
in a way care less about the operating system. We focus on the application and so on and so forth. But at the same time, when it comes to those who are building the plumbings, it, it, clearly at that point, cross-platform really matters because it becomes the weapon of ultimate choice for developers. And as I like to say, it's not just about what you do today. It's about what you do tomorrow. It's about also how you mix and match your development, deployment, testing, et cetera, et cetera, and the need to be able to, to do that. So what is your job at Microsoft? I'm Senior Director for Open Source Communities. This comes with a job description that basically states that I'm the go-to person for open source communities to reach out inside Microsoft. And at the same time, I provide uh, guidance and help to the various Microsoft product groups, I'm believing there are many, who are doing many open source initiatives and you know, in connecting them with the open source communities and making sure that we always do the right thing, that you know, we contribute the right way. So is there a new sense of open source in Microsoft right now, especially now that we're seeing such proliferation of applications out there? I mean, there was a quote by Heroku this morning about one million apps, and you, you yourself talk about how you don't even really need the OS anymore for, for, for app development. So how, is, how are those issues affecting Microsoft right now? Well, we believe that at the end of the day, it all comes, boils down to developers. And the tools they use, the tools that the technologies they are more comfortable with, and making sure that we understand that and we keep providing that kind of choice and that kind of support. So at the end of the day, when it comes to support for open source, there are many, many efforts that are undergoing throughout the company. Right. It's not just, well, Node.js is one of those, but there's more. Uh, our Azure platform supports PHP, it supports Java. Uh, we are contributing to the Linux kernel. It's, it's really all over the place. So, so what's your relationship with Joint? We are partnering with Joint, uh, and it has been a very solid partnership. And the interesting fact is that it has been based on technical bits, so making the code work. Uh, it's not so much a business relationship; it's about coming up together with a common interest, making sure that you know it was in their interest that Node. Uh, was uh, a first-class citizen on the Windows ecosystem. It was, of course, our interest as well. So we aligned, we worked together, we made it happen, and I'm definitely grateful to join for all the support that they gave us. Yeah, um, so tell me about a little bit about uh, what Microsoft's viewpoint is on Node.js at this point, and what is your commitment to it? Well, I, I think we showed a lot of commitment at this stage. We are very excited about the technology. We think that Node.js... Why? Has, well, Node.js has a sort of a unique appeal in mm -hmm. that it appeals both to the JavaScript developers, which is probably the broadest set of developers you can imagine today, but at the same time, it has a unique appeal to those cloud developers who really care about performance, really care about building applications the way they are supposed to be built in the cloud. So it's this confluence of interest that raised our interest, and we said, okay, well, we need to support that. We see the momentum, and we need to make sure that we are backing it. So to that point, it's not just a support to the core, so making sure that it runs on Windows Server, on Windows Azure, on the Windows platform as well, but it's also about making sure that it comes with uh, the best of tools uh, integrating it for Windows Azure, as an example. So we have SDKs and libraries, and that's an ongoing effort. And by the way, those SDKs, those libraries are on GitHub, they're under an open source license, they're for everyone to check it out and you know, fork it, submit a pull request, have fun with it. So you're really focusing on the tool development at this point, or is that a major focus? Uh, it's not just the tool. Uh, a big part of it is the development of the core framework, right. of the core runtime. So we are definitely there. Uh, we were uh, helping and we are embedded in the core Node.js community. Actually, one of my colleagues is a committer to okay. Node.js. Okay. Uh, and also, with, with the help of our work and the, the work that we did with Giant, we also came up with uh, a very nice IO structure library called LibUV. That's very relevant to us as well, because I think that's one of the best byproducts of this effort, because it allows you, you know, to, to write and use more languages. We're seeing that. We're seeing a lot of adaption. So that's another area of interest. So it's the core. It's the module ecosystem, so support for NPM which is uh, built into Windows, and it's support for Azure. So the cloud, the SDKs, and making sure that it runs uh, uh, extremely well and exceedingly well in our cloud platform. So tell me about your communities that you're working with right now. Can you d describe them for us? 
you know, who they are, wow. what they're working on, just oh. general <laughs> generality. I mean, we're just, yeah. I'm just trying, trying to get yeah. a sense of who you see that community is. Absolutely. Well, we're going into specific will require a lot more time because we're, we're working with so many of them. Uh, let me make a few examples. So, well, of course, we know about Node. Uh, right. This is all about uh, what we did this morning. But, uh, you know, the story will not be complete without quoting the work that we've been doing with the Drupal community, the WordPress community, the Joomla communities, uh, bringing, again, support to Azure, support for PHP, uh, support with the, uh, our uh, interaction with the Linux community as well, which kind of surprised That's people. That's an interesting. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. But we are there. Yep. We are there, and we are actually one of the topmost contributors to the Linux kernel nowadays. Uh, so we're really all over the place. I mean, uh, I've been in the company. I'm a recent hire in Microsoft, so to speak. I've been there only for a year and a half, uh, not even that, actually. And I keep discovering new ways and projects that, uh, that Microsoft is doing with open source. So Where were you really before? The place. Uh, I actually had my own company in Europe. It was called Sources. It was an open source systems integrator. Uh, but I've been in open source for 20 years now. I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation. I started with you know, Linux back in 1992. So okay. it kind of goes a long way. And during this journey, I actually discovered Microsoft was definitely changing. Uh, I did a project jointly with Microsoft it was back in 2007, I believe, and that was sort of my first idea of, oh, okay, something's going on there. But in 1995, did you ever think you'd be working at uh, Microsoft? I wasn't there. No. <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> not, really. not really. Well, not coming to the U.S. I actually came from Italy when you know, half ago. So. Right. But, so when, did you, when do you think that shift happened at Microsoft? Was it 2005, 06, 07? It's hard to say. What I can tell you is that uh, when, I, when I first had to... Uh, met Microsoft in 2007, it was definitely uh, a company that was way more open than I expected. So probably sometimes before then. And it, it was very interesting to see because uh, it was about pragmatic discussion, what's best for everyone's business. As I love to say, I, I'm a community guy and the, if there is one thing that I learned is that healthy communities are the one where everyone brings their own agenda, bring their own interests. And Microsoft has always been upfront about that, and this is what I like. So. Okay, we have time for about uh, one more question. I'm, I'm curious about your views on how Node.js is playing out in the enterprise, and mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of the trends that you're seeing? So the one trend that I am seeing is how this connected world of uh, cloud and platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, software as a service, these sort of taking big problem, decomposing them in smaller, more manageable chunks, mm -hmm. and finding for each of those the best solution that will get the job done. Yep. So the main takeaway is that uh, we're going into a polyglot uh, ecosystem where people are going to use more programming languages, more solutions, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what I'm seeing every day, how you know Node is going to be to, to play a big role over there. It won't be the only technology that is going to be used. It depends on you know what our skills are, what the problem set is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it will be definitely important. Well, well great. Well, very, well, thank you very much for thank coming you. out and talking to us today. And you Thanks know, and time. we'll be following you and seeing what you're doing. So, look Absolutely. forward to talking again. Indeed. Thanks, Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, we are. Well, we're going to break for about five minutes here. I'm Alex Williams of SiliconANGLE. We're here live at the at Node Summit in San Francisco, California. We'll be right back with some more interviews. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share 